collection that your classmates can benefit from than the computer collection. And for those of you who are watching the video now that we're recording, obviously you don't want to fast forward because it is only 747. So the actual lecture is not going to start for another 13 minutes. So there's going to be 13 minutes of dead space in this video. So you might want to fast forward. I'll go ahead and start taking attendance. Do you guys have any questions about them? Get the thing running? Nice and easy. Either of you have any uh, plans for the weekend? Or I guess technically you would have to have some kind of plan. <laughs> so what, are you, what are your plans for this weekend? Yeah. Sounds nice hanging out. Yeah. Nothing actually like should go somewhere or anything like that. Just hang out. It sounds amazing. How about you? I really don't. I want to watch my sister's first grade yesterday. What sport? Volleyball. Okay. That's the, so you play too, right? Yeah, that's right. You're going to watch. She's a junior in high school. Okay. Well, that's cool. And those are the fans I have. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me see. I'm going to attempt to guess your names since we have a lot of time. It's just the two of you. If I get it wrong, don't tell me yet. I'm going to see if I can guess it. Hmm. Are you the one of your Saunders? Last name Saunders. No. Made wonderful possibilities. How about Darby? No. Yeah. Ellen? Mm -hmm. Take me a while to get this. Get it. Rock. No, not wrong. Rollins? No. Okay. Jim. All right. So you ran red. So you get 2.5 points instead of 2.4. And if you have time, if you want to, if you like to get on the say, get everybody somewhere, take a picture. And I'll share it. And if you want a little bit more extra points, you can share that. Um, let's see. Um, um, Williams? Miller. I'm going to try to guess your name too. So if I get it wrong, I'll give it to me. Uh, just say, uh, say yes or no. Okay. What is the independent work nearby? It's on. <laughs> I don't know off the top of my head, but starting at the end of this week, so basically 10 weeks from now, technically 10 weeks from this Sunday. And I recommend just getting it done like as much as you can, start turning in papers, turning in papers. If you're done early, then you're done early. And I have this is going to be said that it's going to remind me this weekend just to incentivize people to invite some stuff. I'm going to up the value. So instead of being worth 10 points per page just for this weekend, it will be worth 15 points per page. So because I just want I want people to at least start writing, see how I grade, because a lot of times people wait till the end to do it, thinking, oh, I've got 100 points worth of writing here. And then they see how I grade. They didn't have 100 points worth of grading or writing. And it's, it's, all right. Um, let's see. Young, 
good. First, first shot. Speaking of which, this morning we're going to do my little announcements. If you don't mind, you can, any of you, if I, if I don't remember to announce the independent work thing, so please remind me. Uh, all right, I'm guessing names. So if I get yours wrong, don't tell me what it is. Just say yes or no. I'm trying to get any names. Barbie? Okay. Well, I know we have Crystal here. So that's more than this name to guess from. Just everybody knows we're already recording. So if you have anything to say or ask, find it will be recorded, shared on YouTube. And also, again, you guys in the front row, sometimes it does record whatever's on, on your desk. Wait, we're live streaming on like YouTube right now? No, we're not live streaming. No. I'm just going to record it. <laughs> I guess I could live stream it. Now that I think, well, no, because I like to use Google Meets because that way I have the consistent link and other stuff for other reasons. Also, at the end of every time, when I close this down, I'm going to send you a spreadsheet to think about who's logged in. So if anybody wasn't here and they said they were online, all the ways I could tell they were like Fisher here is online. And when we're done, I should get a spreadsheet. No anyway, um, back to guessing. Do I think Curry, Curry yet? Is we have Curry? Oh, all right. Um, Darby? No. 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 Okay. Don't tell me. Maybe not Ashley. Probably not definitely you and you see. Not Norris, you're not poor. Not your Robins. Definitely not Brother. Saunders? Um, oh, I, I did say one of you and then one of you. Man. Newsom? Okay. <laughs> Starting with Tom, not not Ryan, not Darby, because I already guessed that. Are you said Hamilton? You said oh, oh, yeah. oh okay. So I, took I that. didn't hear you. I'm sorry. That's okay. No. That's okay. Oh. And another guess of game here. Um, I'll pick your helmet. Yes. Ah, the one, the one that I didn't think you were, you are okay. So again, we're already recording. I know I keep saying that, but every time someone new comes in, I want you to know we are recording. It's also a good thing to not have live stream because who knows what might happen. So far, nothing crazy has ever happened in my class, but who knows? Especially if it's live streaming, you might some get some kind of wacko. Like, oh my God, it's live streaming. I'm going to go bust in that room and streak or something. My wife was on a Zoom meeting once. She works for a nonprofit. So this is a you know, formal meeting. Even this is pretty informal, I think. So it's a formal meeting. Somebody just like popped up and it was just their junk and he shook it around. And it wasn't anybody in their organization or anybody who was supposed to be on the meeting. They kind of hacked into the meeting. Yeah. Did that. So, yeah, a lot of reasons I don't like to go live. <laughs> so, while we're waiting, since we're recording, does anybody have any questions about anything? Since we're doing this, let me go ahead and pull this up. Since we're recording, anybody who's watching the video can see this. Maybe I have time. I'm going to try to show you how to do this. For those of you who I don't know if you guys know how to do this or not, but like I said, now that this up and running, everything you need should be on my online. Mine's going to look a little bit different than yours because 
obviously you have a teacher and you're a student. You go up here, click on that. You can log in up here. As you know it, we didn't suck. People coming in. I might do that some other time. But yeah, if you ever, if you do need help logging into WBSU online or finding out where everything is, let me know. And I'll help you out. All right. More main guest here. I know we have Vargas, right? Also, Vargas. We have Vargas. That's why. It's not eight yet, so I feel like that's a okay. thing. Pretty sure that's Vargas. Um, all right, I'm going to guess your name. If I'm wrong, just say yes or no. Don't tell me if I'm if I'm right or wrong. I'm trying to guess. It's hard. Is it Bryant? Um, and Norris? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Williams? Do we have a Williams yet? No. Okay. Vargas? Okay. Um, Saunders. Okay. You get a little extra credit because you're wearing red. Obviously, wearing red. Um, let's see. I don't think we have Rollins here yet, right? Recording. Okay. Um, all about Scott Ashley. Uh, um, Darby. Okay. Okay. Oh, okay, Rollins. So just start start from the top and go down. Since my guessing game is off this morning. Um Dreyfus, actually. Moody. Newsom. Poor. Rollins. Ruffin. Sherman. Taylor Pierce. Thompson. Valdez. Williams. Winfield. And Young. Okay, what's your last name? Did I get you? Good grief, sorry. Okay, so then everybody's accounted for, right? All right. We have some people missing. All right, so let me do some announcements before we get started. Just a reminder, the first assignment is to read the syllabus. And I still have reason to believe most of you have not done that assignment. Trust me, you're going to want to do it. It's important. But anyway, what are the announcements? Oh, yeah, independent work. Start, you know, next Sunday, not this Sunday, not next couple days the next sunday is the first due date right where you have to have 10 points by then so i really recommend writing a paper this weekend and remember a paper could be two sentences you could just think of a biology question and answer i was wondering why my armpits stink i looked it up and according to stinkyarmpits.com it's because this bacteria interacts with that whatever it may be right it could be a couple sentences so try to write a paper but to incentivize you to write a paper this weekend um, i'm going to up the value so for this weekend only about all this. So for this weekend, instead of papers being worth 10 points per page, they're worth 15 points per page. It's not much, but you know, it's a little bit more. So go ahead and write your papers. Don't forget your sources. I know at least one of you has already turned in the paper and I haven't read it yet. And I will this weekend. Um, what else? But does anybody have any questions about independent work? It's usually the most confusing thing for students because uh, there's so many different options. People are like, wait, what exactly do I need to do? So are there any questions? That was a great time to ask because we're recording. Yes. So if you want to write them all, can you? Oh, that's all. Yes. Yeah. And I said that before, like, right before you came in, someone asked. Basically, I said that. Yeah. You can go ahead and knock out the full 100 points now. So, yeah. Of course, like I said, you can write long papers, you can write short papers, you can do whatever you want. Me personally, I prefer to read a bunch of short papers. Sometimes long papers need to be boring, but you can do what you want. So, yeah. Go ahead and knock them out. Yes. So, like, 
If we did like a two page paper, that would count for like two weeks, so it only count for one. You should think of it as points. Okay. Right. So if you're writing a two page paper, like in a normal situation, in a perfect world too, that would be worth 20 points. But don't count on that too. You should think of it. Have you ever seen those fundraisers where there's like a little thermostat and they, they keep like filling it in as, as they get more money until they hit their goal? You should think of it like that. Like you just put change towards your independent work. And you might think, all right, I'm turning in 10 points worth of work. Try not to even think about that. Just think, I'm turn I did this work, I'm turning it in. I don't know how much it's worth, we'll see. But you might think you have a full page, but then when I get in there, and you'll see what I mean when I start grading. It's actually not a full page. And I took a tenth of a point away from this, and a tenth of a point away from that. And I say just do your papers, turn them in, try to find something interesting, and don't worry about how long it is. I think that helps a lot when you have to do that. I hate when you're having to worry about how long your paper is, then you're just adding extra words, or Write crap you're not interested about. Just write what you want to write. Once you're done writing about it, turn it in. And I'll try to come up with a bunch of biology questions this weekend to share them maybe on Facebook or something. Not that you have to answer those, but if one of those questions interests you, like, oh yeah, let me look that up. Or maybe that'll jog your, your thought process and you can think of a different question that you'd like to answer. So anything else? All right, so for attendance, if you're online, um, You'll get, uh, as usual, you're going to need to send the attendance words. So I guess the first attendance word, since I haven't finished mine yet, I really love it, is coffee. So for the rest of you, again, at the end of this class, sometime between the end of this class and 4, 9 a.m., send me these words. If you're online, you have to to get your points. If you're in person, you can if you want to get some extra points for, for your attendance. And if you're online, it's only going to be the max points is going to be worth two instead of 2.4. Because it's an online or an in person course. That's it for the announcements. It's always hard at the beginning of the semester because I have so much I want to tell you, but I also don't want to go over So, are there any questions before we jump back into chapter one? All right. I think we're going to go through this part pretty quickly. Some of it I'm going to slow down, um, but a lot of this probably won't be on the exam. Chapter one is almost like an introduction, like here's what biology is, here's what science is. And then starting in chapter two, that's when we really start getting into biology and science. So for that reason, a lot of this is relatively unimportant as far as grading is concerned. And that's what I'm going to go through pretty quickly. Then I'll remind you what I said um, on Wednesday. My new and part of policy with my new goal is to ask more questions and just sit around and wait for the answers. So if I ask a question, I need some volunteers. I'd love to get your answers to see what you what you know. Or what do you guess? All right. Here we go. Anyway, this is where we left off, right? So the last thing we talked about was how we start small and go big. And this is a really great example of how the class is going to go. Because starting in chapter two, we're going to talk about molecules and atoms. Then we're going to talk about organelles and cells. And then we're going to, and that'll take a long time. We're talking a lot about cells. Then we're going to really jump up and jump up to populations in the ecosystem biosphere. But, that's what you need to know for the exam. There might be one question about it, so just know it in order. And again, you don't have to memorize this verbatim. I'm not going to say list list them all from one to ten in order. No, I'll give you multiple choice and say which one of these is out of order, or which one of these doesn't belong, or something like that. Any questions? All right. Um, if you're taking notes, there's nothing to write down here. This is just what your book describes in biology. Probably is very broad in scope. This is very true. For example, my thesis work for my master's degree was in genetics, like plant genetics. And honestly, that's not even my number one interest. I'm more interested in ecology, which is like how things interact with each other. But you do what you can, right? Um, it's tremendous. There's a tremendous diversity of life, but uh, not all life on Earth is related. That's just one little bullet point. That's going to be basically the whole chapter that we're going to talk about later. We're going to talk about the diversity of life. Um, excuse me, all life on earth is related. I think I don't know if I just said it's not, but it is all related, and we'll talk about that in chapter 13. It's a new book, so I don't know the numbers. The source of all this diversity is evolution. So, again, we'll talk about that later in the, in the semester, both of which are going to be yeah, discussed later in the semester. Let me give you some examples here. This is something you're going to need to know later. I don't know why your book brought it, give it to you now. You don't need to know it yet, but eventually, when we do get there, you're going to need to know this. Um, Hierarchy is classification, right? When you start very broad, like we are all eukaryotes, and that includes all these things dogs, wolves, coyotes, everything on that list, um, trees, you name it, everything basically, basically, but bacteria. We're all related 
when it comes to that, but then you get down to the species. And again, right now that's unimportant. The only reason I kept it in there is because I teach you out of the textbook. And I want you to be able to follow along if that's how it's working. All right, branches of biology. I already mentioned one of them when I talked about my thesis work. But is there any guesses of what some branches of biology are? There's a lot. So whatever you say might not even be on this list, but it probably would be a branch of biology. Any guesses? How about somebody who studies animals? What would you call them? What is it? I guess it's, come on, you guys know this. Somebody must. The branch of biology that studies animals. Zoology. Great, zoology. How about plants? It's a little bit harder, I guess. Botany. How about dinosaurs? Fossils. Paleontology is good. I don't know if I heard you. I don't know if you said it or not. But anyway, yeah, your book might list some branches of biology. These are just some of the examples that come from your book. Molecular biology, which you're going to learn in this chapter or in this semester. Microbiology, which we don't really talk about because that's mostly um, bacteria. Um, neurobiology, obviously, biology of the brain. Paleontology, like I said, dinosaur stuff. Zoology, which is the study of animals. Uh, botany, which is the study of plants. Biotechnology, which is what we do in, in this uh, in this building, actually. Ecology, the list goes on and on. Anyway. You do not need to know this. Again, it's in your textbook, so I included it so you can follow along. But this is also a good idea for every independent work. Um, if you want to look up some other things, like what are some other um, subdisciplines of biology? And you can write just list them off or you can describe what they are. Because again, if had I said not describe microbiology, you might not, not, not have known what it is. So look up some other examples if you want, describe what they are. Maybe if there's some that interest you, you can say, I looked them up. This one seems really boring. This one seemed really cool. Um, anyway, and then even these have subdisciplines, right? So if you're a zoologist, right, you study animals, but some zoologists are only entomologists, where they study insects, or herpetologists, where they study uh, amphibians and reptiles. Anyway, any questions about this? Again, as far as the exams are concerned, that is unimportant. Scientific ethics, we're going to go through this quickly. Scientific ethics, these are obviously important um, in everyday life, but it's not important as far as grading is concerned. Scientists must ensure that their efforts don't cause undue damage to humans, animals, environments. How many of you are scientists? All right, done, right? So you don't need to worry too much about this, but now you know you have to do that. Um, science that this is kind of important to you. Scientists must ensure that their research and communications are free of bias. This is actually really important for you, not because you are going to be doing research and you're going to be communicating, but you need to have a little, I should say, faith. Uh, faith is the, the best word I come up with right now, but it, you, you have a little bit of faith in science because we strive for this, right? Scientists strive to be free of bias. It's not perfect. There is bias, and when it's caught, you know, it's, it's retracted. You know, so if somebody puts out a paper and there's something wrong with it, especially if it was biased, then it's retracted. Um, so anyway, bioethics, that's, that's what brings us to this. That's where biology here. Um, it's important for, for biologists. It's evolving. Your book goes into how it's evolving. Obviously, as technology changes, then bioethics is going to change because there might be something, you know, you can't do it now, right? But eventually, somebody might say, well, should we bring back dinosaurs? Like in Jurassic Park, right? that would be a question of bioethics. Um, but again, it's evolving because as technology evolves and our abilities evolve, then so do, uh, so do bioethics. Um, bioethics defines guidelines. So it's, again, setting rules. The only reason I'm even going through all this is because it's a new textbook. For you guys, I feel like this is unimportant. Um, and usually, this, um, just so you guys know, all these bioethics, they usually came after unethical practices. Or as we said in the Marines, every rule is written in blood, right? So these rules that are in bioethics, it's usually because somebody can broke those rules before they were ruled. Like, they did something wrong, and then someone said, whoa, can't believe you just did that. We should have a rule against that. Anyway, any questions about um, ethics, scientific ethics? All right. Again, you can see your book for some, some uh, examples. All right, let me adjust my screen here. And like I said, I'm going to go ahead and apologize. I'm going through this quickly because as far as the whole semester is concerned, and as far as your um, as far as your exam is concerned, this is not very important. Sorry, now I'm having problems. There we go. Uh, it's not working. It's, sorry. I have to do it this way. 
Okay, let's talk about the process of science. So again, actually, let me ask you before we go forward. Does anybody remember what the definition of biology is? What is biology? What is it that we're studying? Life, life right? We're studying life. Good. And I did, and I did mention I'm not sure how it's going to be on the exam yet. I'm not sure if the proper answer is going to be the study of life or the scientific study of life. But if you see the scientific study of life as your option, choose that. But if not, then it's going to be this uh, study. Anyway, yes, it's a study of life. So, like I said on Wednesday, if we're saying, or if I'm saying it's the scientific study of life, then what is life? And that's what we just got finished talking about. So, the next question is, what is science? And again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly because this is what we're going to be doing. We're going to be doing science the whole semester, right? So, it's not like you need to memorize anything that I'm giving you today. It's all like, hey, this is what we're going to do all semester, and you're going to get used to it throughout the semester. Process of science. It's a little hard to read, but here's your learning objectives. The first one is identify the shared characteristics of the natural sciences. That's the learning objective according to your book. And again, as far as grading is concerned, it's not that important. We're going to be doing this throughout the semester. Number two, understand the process of scientific inquiry. If there's any questions on the exam about this section, this is going to be it. So when we get to it, basically, you're going to need to know the scientific method. But again, there's only going to be a couple questions about that, and we're going to be doing it throughout the semester. So that's why I don't feel the need to test, test you on because you're going to be plenty of experience. Um, compare inductive reasoning with deductive reasoning. I'm going to go through that very quickly. Probably won't have any questions about that on the exam either. We're going to talk about it this once, and then that'll be it. Then throughout the rest of the semester, we're going to be behind us. And then finally, describe the goals of basic science and applied science. And again, that probably won't be on the exam. So my goal is to knock out chapter one as we're supposed to, so we can start chapter two on Monday. Science. All right. You might need to know this. I might ask you the definition of science. And don't memorize it verbatim. Just understand what it means because, you know, when I ask definitions, I usually don't ask them verbatim because I want you to understand the meaning. I don't want you to just memorize the words because if you memorize the words and don't know the meaning, that's useless. Anyway, science gathers knowledge about the natural world. Or another way of saying that, that your book does not say it the way your the old book used to say it is. It's the inquiry based effort to describe and explain nature. And I like that better. It's more specific. So yeah, if you're writing stuff down, you do want to at least know that little point. You know both versions. I don't know which one I'm gonna ask on the exam on the exam, but give you one part. But I won't put them both on. I, if, if ever I get to a situation I'm like I don't know which one I'm going to put on the exam, I'm obviously not going to trick you and put both and have you choose between one or the other. It'll be one or the other. <clears throat> but anyway, the way the reason I like the one in bold a little bit better is the one that's not in bold is it's too broad. Gathers knowledge about the natural world. So do artists, and I love art. I love photography, for example. If you're taking pictures of the natural world, you're gathering information about it, right? But that's not science. It's the inquiry-based effort to describe and explain nature. You're trying to explain things. If you're inquiry-based means you're asking questions and you're trying to answer them. That's what science is. So again, if you take notes for this this page, that's the most important part of there. But also, um, science discoveries are made by a community of researchers, a social enterprise. That's not important as far as important enough to take notes. But again, to me, this is important just for you to know science, scientists don't work in little bubbles, right? They have to share their information, and then that information is then under scrutiny. So by the time it gets to you in a peer-reviewed journal, it's pretty much vetted. And again, it's not perfect, but it's the best we have. It's close to perfect. Um, the science scientific methods include observation, record keeping, logical and mathematical reasoning, experimentation. Submitting conclusions to the scrutiny of others, like I already said right there, the scrutiny of others. That so anyway, we're going to talk about all this in detail on the upcoming slides. But as far as the exam is concerned, probably that's the most important bullet point. And the second word for attendance. You're all nine, or a little extra credit for those of you who are here, will be photography. So let's talk about how photography also gathers information about the natural world. Any questions so far? Okay. Science is from the Latin scientia, means knowledge. You don't need to know that, but now you know. You don't need to know that that means knowledge, but now you know. Your book defines science in a different sentence as the knowledge about the natural world. 
And I shouldn't have bought, I shouldn't have put that in bold because, yeah, that's how you do it. Defines it. One of the ways it defines it because it does it more than once. But I'm not going to, that'll not be an option. I don't like that. That's what the book says. And it's true, it's just not true enough. It's too broad. Because, again, uh, knowledge about the natural world. Well, I can go on and on about that, but let's not do that. Just know you, you don't necessarily need to know that for the exam. Science requires observations that can be confirmed and measured. That's very important. Not for the exam, just so you know. So, and I think, uh, again, this is, in, um, this is a new textbook for me, and also, therefore, a new PowerPoint. So I'm not sure if I'm, uh, what I'm about to say is on other slides, but we'll see. Anyway, observations that we confirm the measure. That's another thing that makes science different than so many other or some of the other things. I'm not saying one's better than the other, but using religion, for example, right? So someone, someone said, you know, why did Maui burn? You know, a religious uh, explanation might be because the volcano gods were mad and they wanted to burn down Maui, right? That cannot be observed or confirmed, right? So therefore, it's not science. Science doesn't deal with things that cannot be observed or confirmed. A scientific explanation might be, well, there was a spark and there was a lot of invasive, invasive grasses and it burned very quickly, very intensely. But again, I'm gonna, that'll be a theme throughout the semester. This requires observations that can be confirmed and measured. It is different than other things like religion. And I'm not saying one's better than the other, um, but they're different. Um, it's subject to repeated testing. That's also important, not for you guys, but again, by the time information gets to you, usually depending on how it gets to you from a peer review journal, it's been tested a few times. It's been vetted. So it's usually true. And again, it's not perfect. Sometimes mistakes are made. Things are reversed, but that is what it is. Oh, yeah. Like I said already, science cannot be applied to purely moral questions. So, so for those of you who have had one by one and wait, first question of the first discussion was, should we use coal? And you had to use an ethical point of view to defend your opinion. So, yes, that was a science class, but that discussion wasn't scientific because in that class, ethics needed to be ever involved but in this class, even though while we do need ethics and science does need ethics, you can't use science to dictate ethics. You can't uh, use science to dictate what is morally correct or morally incorrect. Um, also aesthetic questions, right? What, what looks better, this kangaroo or that kangaroo, right? That's not a science question, that's aesthetics. And again, spiritual questions, right? So what is the meaning of life? That's not a science question. Any questions about this slide? Again, to remind you, as far as the exam is concerned, this is an unimportant side. This is the themes that we talked about throughout the semester. Here's an important one. There's no, you don't necessarily need to write these down yet, because again, I'm going, I don't know, I understand why your book does it in this step, uh, in this order, but we're going to talk about all these separately. Um, but for now, I'm going to go ahead and give you the broad idea. First thing we're talking about is hypothesis. Who knows what a hypothesis is? I mean, you can see it right there, but without reading it, how would you describe a hypothesis? Or how have you been? What have you been told about hypotheses? Yes. Good, yes, that's what a lot of people say. And I don't like that. It's not necessarily, but I'm so glad you said that because I want to, want to let you know it's not necessarily an uneducated guess. I don't like that because, um, or excuse me, an educated guess. Again, going back to the Maui situation, if someone said to me, Why do you think Maui caught on fire? Why do you think we had that fire? Or that, that, that fire? If I had the educated guess that God is angry in Hawaii, that's an educated guess, right? But it's not a hypothesis. The reason is, let's see, it is a suggested explanation for an event, so so far over there, but it cannot be tested or falsified, right? So again, if you're religious, I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm just saying that's not within the scope of science. I can't test that. We can't test to see if God is angry at Maui. We can't falsify that. That's another interesting thing. You can look this up for independent work. When you really start thinking about it, there's a lot of things science can't do. Um, like things being falsified. What I mean is, I cannot, someone can technically prove Bigfoot exists if Bigfoot does exist. That is within the scope of science. But you can't say Bigfoot does not exist. There's no proof that he does not exist. There's no proof that Bigfoot exists. There's, you can't falsify it, right? And I'm going to give a lot of examples of that throughout the semester because a lot of pseudoscience people, the people who are against science, that's how they fight back against science. Is they'll put out something, they'll put something out there that can't be falsified. And by the definition of what they're putting out there, the fact that it can't be falsified, it's not science. And you'll see what I mean. I'll give you some real life examples later in the semester. Okay, so that's a hypothesis. And we're going to talk about hypotheses later. But for now, let's move on to scientific theories. 
these are not the same. I correct people all the time. It sucks too. I'll even do it occasionally. People who use the same use those words um, interchangeably. A lot of time you hear people say theory when they mean hypothesis. Like I'll tell my grand my in-laws, like, man, my kids, my kids went to sleep last night. I don't know what's going on. And then my uh, you know, mother-in-law might say, Well, my theory is they had this to eat before you put them to bed. That's not a theory, that's a hypothesis, right? Because that could be tested. Like, oh yeah, I gave them corn. We'll see what happens when I don't give them corn, right? That's a hypothesis, it's not a theory. So what is a theory? The theory is a generally accepted scientific, excuse me, it's generally accepted uh, that through thoroughly tested and confirmed explanation for a set of observations or phenomena. So the big difference here between the theory and the hypothesis, at least right now, until we get to the other side, is bigger, right? The hypothesis is very specific. It answers this very specific question. Theories are very broad. They don't answer bigger questions. And you'll see what I mean when I give you some more examples as we move. Um, and the thoroughly tested. So very specific hypothesis might be tested once or twice and confirmed. But the theory has a lot of um, a lot of data to support it. And again, I'll give you some more um, some more examples as we move forward. And scientific theories are the foundation of uh, basically of all the science that we do, especially in this course. Then we get into scientific laws, which we don't really deal with in this class, which your book mentions that scientific laws are often expressed in mathematical formulas. So they're like gravity, right? That's going to be expressed in um, by math. Then it describes how nature will behave under specific conditions. So for the exam, this slide is not perfect. Excuse me, this slide is not important. These two are important, but we're going to talk about them uh, later in this presentation. And I'm also going to share with you some videos that really go into talking about the differences in relationship between these words. Even though you don't necessarily need to know them for the exam, more than hard to know. And of course, the video. So if you watch them and answer the questions while you watch them, you can get a little independent work points. Any questions about this slide? Okay. I guess the next word for attendance, as we just talked about it, will be fire. You know, something that comes out of the light, fire. Okay, a theory. Again, we're going we're to talk about it in a little bit more detail. This is not from my textbook. But I kind of really want to emphasize what the theory is. This is from the previous textbook. So because of that, I'm not going to necessarily, um, probably won't test you on this, but let's talk about it anyway. The theory is a comprehensive, well-substantiated explanation that's broader in scope than a hypothesis. So everything I just said in that previous slide, there it is again in writing. So it's not very specific. It's very broad. And I'm going to give you some examples on the next slide. Um, it's only widely accepted if it's supported by a large, buried, growing body of evidence. So again, this is why I don't like it when people use the word theory in everyday life. Because when they need hypothesis, because when you say, oh, it's just a theory, that sounds like it doesn't mean anything. But in real life, a theory has been well substantiated. Like the theory of evolution is well substantiated. Now, there might be some specific hypotheses. Like, I think this species came from this species. Uh, if it's very specific, that might be, you know, more of a hypothesis. And again, I give you some examples, but theory is a very broad scope. And they're widely accepted because they have a large growing body of evidence. They're used to explain many observations and devise new and testable hypotheses. So again, there's that relationship between theory and hypothesis. Theories are broader, and a theory can lead to a hypothesis, right? A hypothesis doesn't necessarily lead to a theory, a theory can lead to a hypothesis. Many different hypotheses. And I'll give you an example here in a second. And like any scientific idea, theories must be refined or abandoned if new contradictory evidence is discovered. It's another reason why I love science, because it's not perfect. And when we find out something is wrong, then it's fixed, it's amended. We say, well, that's not the case anymore. It's not always really quick to happen. Sometimes it takes a while. But yes, that is the case. So any questions about this slide? All right. So here we go. Let's talk, let's talk about the relationship between hypotheses and theories. First, let me give you two random hypotheses. No need to write any of this down. I'm not going to test you on this. I'm just giving you an example. Here's two unrelated hypotheses. Number one, long, thin roots are an adaptation that helps some plants survive in an urban habitat. So there's a little plant that's growing in the, in the crack between like a pavement and a lighthouse. Right? So my hypothesis after saying that might be the thing about the long, thin roots. Another random hypothesis might be the unusual bone structure in hummingbirds' wings is an evolutionary adaptation that provides an advantage in gathering nectar from flowers, right? Two completely different hypotheses. One's about plants, one's about birds. 
but they have a they have a relationship. They're related to each other, and that's where the theory comes in. In contrast, the following theory ties together these seemingly unrelated hypotheses, and this is the theory of evolution. Adaptations to the local environment evolve, or should be natural selection, evolve by natural selection. No need, no need to write that down by the whole chapter. But again, you can see this theory, this theory of natural selection is very broad. And with that one broad uh, theory, we can have all these different hypotheses, which is another good independent work topic. So think about anything for humans and ask yourself, is there a natural selection reason behind it? And you can get creative with it. I, I think of all kinds of crazy, weird things. And sometimes I look at my, like, how do I put this without getting too deep <laughs> or without getting myself in trouble? So sexually, right, there's general, and it's not always everybody's different, everybody has different tastes, but generally speaking, there's certain attributes that men like in women, if you're into that, and certain attributes that women like in men, if you're into that. So you have to ask yourself, is there an evolutionary reason why heterosexual men like whatever in females? Is there an evolutionary reason that heterosexual women like whatever in men? So think about that in your head, or whatever else you can think of, and look it up. Is there an evolutionary reason why we like those things, or anything else? Is there an evolutionary reason why humans across the world love music? All these different cultures that prior to the 20th century never even contacted each other. These are isolated groups of humans, yet they all came up with music. Things like that. Whatever you can think of. Doesn't even necessarily have to be about science, right? Because music is not science, but you could think and then look it up. Anyway, any questions about that? All right, let's move forward. A fact, this is also not in your textbook, but I loved it. What is the fact? The fact is the piece of information that is considered objectively true based on all current evidence. This is so important, not just in this class, not just in your undergraduate degree, but your whole life. People mix up facts and opinions and things like that. Objectively true. So if I were to say, do you guys know what a Mexican Chinese is? The Mexican restaurant right down the road. If I were to say, fact, uh, the Mexican Chinese, or whatever it's real name, Los Gabes, they have the best salsa in the Canal Valley. That's not a fact, right? It might be for me, but that's not objectively true. That's subjective, right? That's what I think. Um, but a fact can be verified, and therefore it is distinct from opinions. So if I were to say, fact, uh, Los Gabes is 3.2 miles from here. That would be a fact. I mean, I thought I'm correct, but you could actually look that up. We can verify it. We can measure it. That's a fact. Um, and I love this bullet point here. Again, this is from your previous textbook. Many people associate facts with science, right? Because we do need facts in science, but accumulating facts is not the primary goal of science. I'm not going to text you on any of that. But a good example of that was my thesis work with the genetics that I was telling you about. So I was looking at gene expression in watermelon plants. I won't even get into the details. It'll probably bore you. But I was looking at all these different genes and, you know, it's like, all right, this, one, this gene was expressed this much. This one was expressed that much. This one was expressed this much. Those are facts and they don't mean nothing. All those facts meant nothing unless someone came together and said, all right, this is what these facts mean. These facts support this hypothesis. So it's not just gathering facts. And I'm glad the old textbook said that. Um, but again, corner, uh, facts are the cornerstone of science and are the explanations that apply to the greatest variety uh, I'm not going to ask you anything about that, so let's move forward. Um, the old textbook also points out that Newton, Darwin, and Einstein stand out in history of science, not because they had a bunch of facts, but because they had big, broad theories that explained a lot. And again, I'm not going to ask any questions about this. So I'm trying to move forward quickly. <coughs> now, back to your textbook. Your textbook distinguishes the difference between natural science and some other stuff. I'm going to go through it pretty quickly. I probably won't ask you any questions about it. Uh, natural sciences are sciences that relate to the physical world and its phenomenon, unlike social sciences, right? Um, you can think of anything you might see in a natural science museum. So, for example, biology, astronomy, physics, chemistry, math, geology. If you want to, for independent work, look at this list and see if there's anything that's not on that list and write about it. So, well, according to whatever.com, these other things are also natural sciences. Well, I'm not going to test you on any of that. It's not important in the grand scheme of the semester. Again, I text out a textbook because it's one of the other course. Natural science, uh, there's no complete agreement when it comes to defining what is natural science and what is not. There's a lot of that in science. We'll talk about that throughout the semester. Some even divide natural sciences into life science and physical sciences. That's pretty obvious, right? Life sciences are things like biology, right? You're dealing with something that's alive. 
physical science would just not do that. Um, however, the natural sciences blend together. For example, we have biophysics, right? So you have biology and you have physics together. Um, biochemistry, obviously it's in the name, you have biology, you have chemistry. All those things that I'm not going to ask you about on the exam, but do you have any questions about this slide? So again, I'm sorry I'm going through this quickly, but I teach out of the textbook. You don't necessarily need to know this. Um, talk about this very quickly, even though I probably won't ask you anything about this on the exam either, but we're gonna talk about it throughout the semester. The difference between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Actually, can anybody explain it in your own terms without reading this? I'd love to hear your your way of describing it. No one? All right, it's not very important. I mean, I guess that's a good thing to know, but not necessarily for the exam. Inductive reasoning uses related observations to arrive at a general conclusion, right? The opposite is true of deductive reasoning. It uses hypothesis-based science. Um, it uses general principles to predict something. And uh, this is a real, really weird way to explain it, but hopefully it'll stick in your head. And it's not exactly accurate, but it gives the general idea. You can think of racism or sexism or any ism, right? So if we're talking about racism, use related observations to arrive at a general conclusion. That would be like racism, right? Like, you know, I, I've, I've noticed that every, everybody I've seen from this race does this. Everybody I see from this race does this, right? That would be inductive reasoning. The opposite, or the related thing, deductive reasoning would be like, again, if you're racist, you would say something like, well, I know people from this race do that. So here comes somebody from this race. They're going to do this. Does that make sense? So inductive reasoning is you're looking at all these, all these observations and saying, oh, that must be true, this. And the opposite is true for deductive reasoning. Like, okay, knowing what I know about this, then I can predict this. Of course, that's a bad example because that's a bad thing to do. But in science, again, you would have all these observations, right? And then from all those uh, observations, you could come to a conclusion. But in deductive reasoning, you would take what you do know to make a prediction. And again, I probably won't ask anything about this, but I will share some videos for you to watch. Any questions about the differences between inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning? Might finish this in time. Good. Uh, the two main pathways of scientific discovery or study. Probably won't ask this either. Um, descriptive or hypothesis-based science. Descriptive or discovery science aims to observe, explore, and discover. Right. So, who here has heard of Jane Goodall? No one. Okay, well, we got one person. So she was the lady who basically studied chimpanzees, right? She just went out and studied. That would be like a uh, descriptive science or discovery science. You're just taking in observations and taking in data. Hypothesis-based science, basically, before I even read this, it's just answering questions. So as opposed to just taking down a bunch of information and collecting data, hypothesis-based science, you have a question that you're trying to answer. You come up with a tentative answer, right? We already said that's what a hypothesis is. A tentative answer, and you, uh, you try to explain it, try to answer it. Anyway, and your book also points out the boundary between the two often overlap, which makes sense because if you're observing chimpanzees for 20 years, you know, you're going to make these observations and you're going to come to some conclusions. See, I wonder why is it that every time there's a full moon that the chimpanzees do that, right? Then there's a question, and then you can come up with a hypothesis and then test your hypothesis. So that would be a good example of overlap. Anyway, not that you need to know it, but there are there any questions about the difference between descriptive and hypothesis driven science? Okay, trying to go quick. And if you were to look these up for independent work, depending on your source, that might be described a little bit different. But anyway, here's what you do need to know for the exam. So I'm going to follow on and let you guys write this down. We're going to talk about them in detail. But for the exam, there's going to be at least one question where I said, what is the scientific method? And again, just like the other stuff, you don't have to regurgitate it, the whole thing in order. But it, because it's a multiple choice exam, so it'll, it'll be like, which one of these is out of order? Or which one of these is in the correct order? Or which one of these does not belong because it has something in it that's not in the scientific method? And you're going to get really familiar with this and throughout the semester because we're going to do it every week in lab. Observation is the first step, then question, then hypothesis or hypotheses if you have more than one. You have a prediction, you have an experiment. You analyze your results, then you report it. Now, if you were to look this up, even in the old textbook, if you somehow knew somebody about it, and you were to look up the scientific method, it would look different than this. So it's just a general guideline. And depending on your source, it's going to be, um, there's going to be maybe extra steps or fewer steps. A lot of times people leave out prediction. Um, 
or it might be used differently, or excuse me, worded differently. But for the purposes of this exam, you need to know this. Know it in that order, and we're going to discuss each one differently or separately. And I'll give a quick example. A goofy one, because I find goofy things easier to remember. If I observe that when my friends come over, we're hanging out late at night at the fire, and they pee, and I don't want them to go inside and wake up my wife and my kids. I say, just pee outside. They always pee in the same corner. If I observe that the grass in that corner of my yard is really nice, really green and lush, the grass in the rest of my yard is not as nice and green and, lush, and, green and lush, right? That's my observation. Obviously, my question is going to be, is urine good for, for grass, right? I will lead to that question. The next step, obviously, after you ask a question, is coming up with an answer. In this case, in science, it's an answer that you can test, i.e. a hypothesis. So my hypothesis could be, yes, urine is good for plants. And that leads you to predictions. And this, is, to me, is so important. And you know this if you've had no long way in class. Of course, we only did it in some of the uh, labs. But you can have one hypothesis. And in real science, you don't just test it once and be like, oh, I'm done. This experiment supported my hypothesis, so my hypothesis is correct, right? That's not how it works. In real science, you come up with a hypothesis, and you come up with many predictions, different ways to test your hypothesis. So, again, a prediction describes how you're going to test your hypothesis. It usually uses an if-then statement. And, again, the important thing in my book is that you're using more than one prediction to test your hypothesis. So, prediction one, if I tell my friends to pee in the other part of the yard, then the grass in that part of the yard will start looking nice too, right? That's one way of doing it. Um, if I tell my friends to stop peeing in the yard, then the grass won't be as nice and lush. That's another way of uh, testing my hypothesis. If I have 100 plants and 10 of them get 100% water, 10 of them get 10% urine, 10 of them get 20% urine, so on and so forth. If I did an actual experiment, then the ones that get the most urine will grow the best, whatever, right? So there's all these different predictions I can come up with to test the hypothesis. To me, those are the important parts. Then obviously you're gonna come up with the experiment. And to me, since I've talked so much about the prediction, that kind of explains the experiment. The experiment is you actually do what you said in the prediction. You have your friends stop peeing in this part of the yard, start peeing in that part of the yard. And then in real science, you, know, you actually take data. So the peeing in one part of the yard, peeing in the other part of the yard is kind of a bad example when we get to the analyzation portion, because you can't really analyze that. You're just saying, yeah, this looks good or this doesn't. In real science, you're going to take measurements. Like, All right, well, they grew this much versus that much, right? You want numbers. Um, and then finally, when you're done, and you guys will never have to do this well once when you do your lab report, but you have to, scientists have to report their discussions. I mean, they're, they're fine. Anyway, that's this. And that was a really broad explanation. And now we're going to talk a little bit more about each one of them individually, specifically. But again, for the exam, know this in this order. Observation, question, hypothesis, prediction, experiment, analyze, report. Any questions? All right. So the next word for attendance will be urine. That's what we're just talking about. It. Okay. Experiment. Again. It's out of your textbook. Um, I don't know why you have a textbook went straight for experiment, but let's talk about it. Uh, the experiment uses one or more variables, and you need to know what a variable is. Maybe because I'll, I'll, I'll ask it on the exam, but more, more importantly is because I'm going to use these words a lot, especially in lab. A variable is any part of the experiment that can vary or change during the experiment. So for those of you who have had the one way class, and hopefully you guys who have it can understand this. They did this virtual experiment where they wanted to see how temperature, the temperature of the water affected the breath rate of goldfish. So they changed the temperature of the water and then they measured how many breaths a fish took, the fish took in 30 seconds. So in that case, you know, the, the, the temperature of the water was the variable. That was the part that changed during the experiment. And I'm gonna come back to that when I get to the next slide. It's not gonna be a textbook, in my opinion, it's a better explanation to go do it in more detail. The control is something that does not vary. So the variables vary, the controls do not. So if I wanted to grow a set of plants to see if urine was good for plants, and I was giving each one of them 
different amounts of urine. That would be the different amounts of urine would be the variables. The control would be everything else. Obviously, we want to make sure it's all the same plants because you can't can't compare like a, a weed, the growth of a weed to the growth of a red uh, a redwood tree, right? Um, I want to make sure that they're planted in the same soil, right? Because what if one soil is really fertile and the other was not? Is it the, the urine that's making the difference, or is it the soil? I want to make sure they get the same amount of sunlight and the same temperature, all that stuff. So that's the stuff that's not very. Um, yeah. Anyway, so any questions about the difference between a variable or a control? Before I get to the next slide and discuss something that was not in the textbook, but does a little bit better job of um, explaining. Eight minutes. Hopefully, we can do this. So, to test the hypothesis, you have to run tests multiple times with one factor changing and all other factors just being constant. So, again, this I just took this from my old PowerPoint because this is from your textbook. So, again, a variable is a factor that changes in an experiment. And here's something that you don't necessarily need to know because it's not new textbook, so I'm not going to ask you. But a controlled experiment is one that compares two or more groups that differ only in one variable that the experiment is designed to test. So again, with the um, the plant thing, right? Uh, we'll go to the goldfish, right? There was a different groups of goldfish, and the thing that changed was the temperature of the water. That was a controlled experiment. The temperature of the water was the variable. The control group lacks or does not receive the specific factor. Again, it's not from your textbook, so I'm not going to ask you that your textbook doesn't talk about what a control group is. I already told you that control is something that doesn't change. But a control group would be the group that didn't uh, get the experiment. So if you wanted to test out a medication to see if it worked, you know, different people would get different doses, but the control group would get none of it. Um, and then the experimental group would be kind of like the opposite of the control group. They're the, the group that's actually getting the thing changed, the variable. So again, not from your textbook, but there it is. Are there any questions about that? Moving right along. Again, this is still not from your textbook, so we technically can't test you on it. This is important information for when we get to the labs. The difference between an independent and dependent variable. An independent variable varies the variable only change is not affected by what's going on. Right. Meanwhile, the dependent variable is the thing that's being studied and measured in the experiment and changes as a result of the changes to the independent variable. So in the goldfish case, the temperature of the water would be the independent variable. That's the thing that we we're changing. And its breath rate was the dependent variable. The breath rate was dependent on the temperature of the water. If I was doing the urine experiment on the plants. The amount of urine, the concentration of urine that each plant was getting would be the independent variable. The growth rate of the plant would be the dependent variable. The growth rate, according to you know that experimental design, would be the, um, dependent on the concentration of urine. Or another way to think about it is the independent variable is the cause and the dependent variable is the effect. So once again, I'm going to go through this quickly. Let me keep going. Only because this is not in your textbook. So for the exam, I'm not going to ask the difference between independent and dependent variable. But you're going to need to know that for the labs because we will be using independent variables and dependent variables. So if you take a note, and I see a lot of you are, I guess you can give your give your note taking hand a break because this will not be on the exam. And also, um, you know, all of these you guys have access to all these on the WBH going on. Any questions about this slide? Okay, I'm gonna really skip through this because even with my last uh, last course before I started using the textbook, I never even read this slide. I have it there for you to look at. Because um, really, again, I'm not gonna test you on this, but you can look about what into what a placebo is. It's basically like a fake. Um, we've already talked about this, the scientific method. And since we don't have time, I'm not gonna get this this example. But I will say this: if you have, if you have access to it, read this example. Because again, in the exam, I'm not going to specifically ask you to list off the scientific method. But one of the questions is I'm going to say something like, in this case, I'll give you a scenario. Like you tried to turn on the TV, you hit the power button, um, the TV didn't turn on. And then I might say something like, which one of these is a hypothesis? Which one of these is a question? Which one of these is a prediction? So if I say, you know, the road's batteries are dead, and that's one of the choices, you like, oh yeah, that's, that's, that's a hypothesis. If I say the TV is not working um, because it's cursed, that's not a hypothesis, right? It's close because it is an explanation that you can't test it. So anyway, 
because we're short on time, I'm just going to go go forward and I can give you examples. I've already given you some, but look it over when you get a chance. This one I'm definitely not going to give you. Going to talk about. This is for you for you to read. This is another example between the relationship between hypothesis and prediction, right? So here's a hypothesis that you can come up with all these different um, predictions to test it. Okay, now we'll really go through quickly on this because, in my opinion, this is not that important. I'm teaching out of the textbook. What is basic science? Basic science is also known as pure science, and it's a science for the sake of knowledge. So, in my opinion, what I was doing with my thesis work, looking for these genes, to me, it was basic science. However, um, for my for the people I was working for, it was actually applied science, aka technology, aka problem solving. Like, I just wanted to know which genes were responsible for this thing the plant did, just because I wanted to know. But that actually had a problem solving purpose because those genes made the plants do a certain thing and that certain thing protected them from uh, insects. So for me, it was basic science for the people I was working for was applied science. But there you go, there's a difference between basic science and applied science. And I'm not gonna ask you um, that both can work together for DNA, or both can work together. I won't even give you that example yet. Let's keep moving. I'm trying to get this done before it's too late. I'm going to talk about this very quickly, too, because I'm not going to test you on it and because you're doing independent work. So I'm going to you a lot of examples of this throughout the semester. Peer review, right? Before a scientist could just put out their information and say, hey, I did this experiment. This is my hypothesis and it was correct. And here it is, right? It has to go through something called peer review, which is basically like a quality control, right? Other people, other sometimes um, anonymous people, but qualified people look at it, see if it's legit or not. So again, by the time you get it, by the time you read something that's been peer reviewed, it's been vetted. Um, and again, not in your textbooks, we'll go through this quickly. Pseudoscience, shoot. Yeah, I'll just go through, I'm just gonna skip it because it's not in your textbook, so I'm not gonna ask you. Read this though, you definitely should know what pseudoscience is. I'm gonna give you a lot of examples of pseudoscience throughout the semester, um, hopefully relevant to each chapter we talk about. Pseudoscience is basically fake science, and there's a lot of it out there, especially right now. Well, COVID's kind of dying off a little bit, at least the Socially, it's dying off, but there's a lot of pseudoscience out there about the vaccine and things like that. Um, anyway, anecdotal evidence that's not real evidence. That's just like saying, okay, again, using the vaccine is an experiment. Like, well, my cousin had the vaccine and he lost his little toe. Okay, but that's anecdotal evidence, right? That just means you saw it. And the, the thing that's like about anecdotal evidence is it's really powerful, it's useless, but it's powerful, right? So, if you know somebody. So again, just using the, the vaccine as an example. If you know somebody who took the vaccine and then something bad happened to them, that's really powerful because that's someone you love, right? And that happens. So even though statistically you probably had nothing to do with the vaccine, in your brain, you've drawn that association. We'll talk about that throughout the semester. And here's a little chart that kind of um, explains the difference between real science and pseudoscience. This is really important. So definitely not for the test, but find this, maybe even download that picture, keep it somewhere on your computer. When you're writing, your independent work go through this checklist because i will check your sources right so make sure you're not giving me garbage sources so if, again if you're going to write about the safety of vaccines and you were sourced to something like www.vaccinesarethedevil.com you might consider that not a good source right obviously it's going to be a little bit biased so no need to write this down i'm just saying go you might want to find that powerpoint download that and keep that in mind when you write your uh and so that's it. We did it. So the last one for attendance is red because it's Red Friday. We did it. So on Monday, we'll start chapter two over the weekend. If you can, at least start reading chapter two. So I don't know what we're getting into. And I hate to say it this way, but I think that's when we're getting into the real, the real science. So I really, really need to know. All right.